thank you very much for joining us. Um, so this is our Liverpool Fostering Service first Facebook Live. Uh, and we thought what better time to do it than during foster care fortnight. So thank you for anyone joining us. If we've got any colleagues, any foster carers, it would be great if you could uh, share the stream so we can spread the word. Um, so we're coming to the end of foster care fortnight and foster care fortnight is a time to celebrate the difference that fostering makes, but also to raise awareness about the need for more foster carers, which is needed right across the country, but especially we're talking about the need for foster carers in Liverpool. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this, this evening we've been joined by Jill and Les and Phil. Um, so Jill and Les are foster carers with Liverpool. Phil his, has been an approved foster care with Liverpool, but he also works as part of our team and speaks to people thinking about fostering as well. So we're going to hear from both of them this evening. Um, so the theme, just to set the tone, the theme for this year's Foster Care Fortnight was why we care. Um, so I just wondered if you could, maybe Jill and Les, you could start to tell me a bit about why you care about fostering and what brought you into fostering in the first place? Want to start or you yeah, want to start? you can start. Okay, so <laughs> when we were younger, um, very young, we made the decision that we were going to have two children and then we were going to adopt two children. Um, I don't know why we made that decision, but we just did. <laughs> and uh, so we had two children and then we said, you remember that thing we said years ago that we were going to do? And we had a discussion about it, and then we we started to investigate adoption, and then we thought about fostering, and because we wanted to impact as many lives as we could, um, and then we started the ball rolling uh, to become foster carers, um, and it spiraled from there. The craziness yes. started from there. <laughs> Fabulous. And uh, what about you, Phil, in terms of your journey to becoming a foster carer, and what it what um, well. It? Uh, I'm my my I'm married and my, it's entirely my wife's fault. She I hadn't <laughs> massively thought about. I don't don't find that funny. I hadn't massively thought about fostering, and my wife said to me, "Would you like to find? Should we go out on a date? Like the worst date in history? Should we go and find out about fostering? And maybe it wasn't the worst date. Maybe it was the best date. Um, we we she'd found out. My wife would find out about an event run by the council where you find out about fostering. Went along to this sort of fairly bland community centre by Sefton Park. We live by Penny Lane. Went along, social worker spoke, didn't understand what they were talking about, to tell you the truth. And then a foster carer spoke and she was so amazing. She actually put me off because she was so incredible looking after teenagers. And she spent all, all, you know, she had loads of stories, but they were like, I'm not doing that because we are the most boring people in the world. Me and my wife got two kids. We got, uh, we had, a, at the time, we had a couple of rabbits. You know, we lived in a semi-detached house by Penny Lane. Why would we want to foster? And then the, the third person who spoke at the event was a kid that had grown up in care. And mm -hmm. she just spoke about what it was like. Um, basically, how terrifying a lot of it was turning up at some stranger's house, expected to kind of just fit in. And, you know, she sort of said, if you, if you think you could make that experience good for a kid, maybe you could foster. And, um... We went home, we thought about it, we chatted about it. And um, our son, who was, I think, five at the time, was going on a sleepover that weekend. And it was like his first sleepover that wasn't a, a relative's. And he, I said, right, Jamie, that's his name, get everything ready for the sleepover. And he basically got everything he owned ready to take to his mate Dan's house in Old Swan. He got all his football tops, he got all his spare clothes, he got Power Rangers, he got sweets, he got sleeping bags, he got duvets. I drove him over to his friend's house and he was so excited, but also a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. And um, he was only going for one night. He was going with all his stuff. He was going to his best friend, Dan's, and he knew Dan's mum and dad and he knew Dan's sisters. And, in, and he knew in the morning we'd pick him up and he knew if he was scared, he could ring. He could get them to ring us and we'd come and get him. He knew what they were having for tea. And I just thought, if you're like that, if you're that nervous... You know, excited but nervous. If you're nervous for one night and you know where you're going, what must it be like to go to, to total strangers? And maybe we could we could be those strangers that would at least do the best we could to make somebody feel comfortable, uh, as comfortable as you can be when you go and, and have to live in, in with foster care. So we, we applied and that's 11 years ago. And here we are. 
That's how we. That's a long answer. So I'll try. Get really one, I'll get the next one shorter. I probably won't. I won't. That's fine. That's great. Um, and Jill and Les, do you say how long? How long have you been fostering for now? And during that time, how has um, how has it impacted your lives? And what what has it meant to you? What what's changed for you? So we were just we were arguing about this before. I'm going to be honest <laughs> about what dates that we started. So uh, Les and I first went with Nosley uh, Council because it's where we lived. Um, and we fostered with them for two and a half years. Um, we had some good experiences with the children, but didn't feel we got enough training or support. Um, and when you first start off in this job, it, you can feel quite vulnerable because until you do it, you, you, you don't know what you're doing. And even when you start doing it, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. So you need help from someone who does. Um, and so we then moved to Liverpool. So all together, we've worked it out to be eight years we've been fostering for. Years, yeah. So I think for us, um, it had a bigger impact than we thought, if I'm being really honest. And especially for the... So I, I was the one who sort of like um, said, can we become, you know, I want to be a foster carer. And genuinely as a family, we thought it would just be my role and they could potter around me and I could grab them when I needed them. But actually what we've, this is just us Percy, all the children actually have come to us have valued a male role model. So actually it impacted on our life more than we thought because Les had a much bigger role than we first anticipated. Yeah. Um, and that's been really important. Um, and I think the rules are hard to get used to for a bit. But eventually, it's like any job, you, you adapt and it just becomes the norm and it just becomes, um, yeah, it, it, even for our daughters and things like that. It, it, you know, it can take time away from them, but it's just about having a good network of people who can support and allow you to have time with your birth children as well as have time as a family, yeah. mixed family and as a family individually as well. So. And how old were your birth children when you became a fostering family? So we'll, we'll hold our hands up and say we were chickens because we actually applied to become foster carers when they were quite young. So say they were about 10 and 8. Yeah. And we got right through to the end to panel and we just pulled out. <laughs> we, we bottled it. We did. We panicked. Yeah. Fast. <laughs> and I just panicked because I thought they're too young, they're too young, you know. So our children were actually a little bit older. So ours were 15 and 13 when we started. Um, but for us, I felt that was a good age because they were independent themselves. Um, so it wouldn't have um, mattered where the child went to school or those kinds of just logistical things that you have to think about. Yeah. And how would you say as be, becoming a foster family being for them as well, being, you know, being quite a big change for everyone? Um, I think they massively benefited from, from yeah. it because well there's two two prongs number one because we had to do things like the skills to foster mm -hmm. which is you, you initially do you actually learn things about how you are as a parent so when you are learning about some people can take it offensively and say, oh, you know, I, I think I'm a fantastic parent. And then or, other people can go, actually, you know what? I was doing that wrong. I kind of should have done this. And, and, and then you go back and you, and if you, with your own children, then you actually start to utilize those skills that you've gained from your fostering experience with your own children. And, and, it, and it massively impacts how they interact with you. The other thing as well is that they get to see that the lifestyle that they have is actually a privilege and a privilege that's been taken away from a lot of young children who, who, who don't have that privilege, who don't have the ability to have a mobile phone and have a, um, you know, have sleepovers and have uh, be run around in cars to places and have a meal on the table and to have all these different things and to see that children have come into our home and not had that and they've taken it for granted makes them much more reflective about who they are in the world and I yeah. think so yeah massively massively impacts them yeah. yeah so they appreciate things a lot more and I've, I've heard that a lot of foster carers have said um 
you know you become a better parent uh, in general and I've heard mm. I've heard some of the some of the techniques and skills that foster care is using God I you know I should use that definitely <laughs> that that yeah. you know it's yeah. it's good all around and Phil your your children were a bit younger weren't they when you became a foster yeah parent? so our kids were I think um six and eight by the time we got approved and they can't quite remember what it was like to not foster so they you know I know but but it has become a bit like Les and Jill it's become something that we do as a four if that makes sense and our our birth, I mean, we don't call them the birth kids do you know what I mean we just say the kids yeah. our, our our but our big two we call them the big two often <laughs> because the our we've always fostered the when it's worked best is when we fostered kids younger than them so there's an obvious pecking order and you know my daughter is the top then my son and then whoever we possibly, I know it sounds a bit mean, but it's like, it's a natural pecking order and it's worked well. But um, our our birth kits have been really, it's been a really important value for our family that we try and help other people just the way we are. It's important to us to, to try and empathise, sympathise with people who have got a more difficult life, difficult lifestyle than we've got. And our birth kits have been really good. And there's been tensions occasionally. You know, it's not all brilliant. It's not like we're living in a, you know, some TV show where everyone gets on all the time. But our birth kids have been great at being role models to the kids that we fostered, looking out for them, just teaching them how to be a, how to be a kid in a way. And I mean, I've got an, an awful lot of stories. The one bit of tension we did have once, which was a bit of a funny story, was we told our birth kids when we fostered, if anything ever gets broken, we'll fix it. If a foster kid breaks it, we'll we'll get you a new one. One day, my daughter came downstairs and went, he, meaning the foster kid, he has destroyed my mirror. And this little kid, I think he was about seven or eight, he got into her room, which he wasn't allowed to do. He'd seen himself in her full-length mirror. And she was about 14 at this time. And he'd gone, there's me. And he thought, I'll draw me. So he picked up the first thing that came to hand, which was lipsticks. And he'd done a full-size picture of himself in her mirror so it was like about four foot high and I went okay so you know and, and my daughter goes the lipsticks are knackered they're ruined you need to buy me new ones and I'm a bit rubbish at all this and I was like all right we'll go down home and bargain I'll get you some more <laughs> lipsticks and yeah you're laughing and my daughter went home and bargain are you joking are you joking these there were two I, I don't even know what these are two of them were L'Oreal and one was a Mac so that yeah. costs like yeah yeah like what what, what is that what, do, what are those mean Anyway, that picture cost us 60 quid in lipsticks. Um, but, and you know, there's a little bit of tension. And that was obviously a funny story in the end. But that little kid was just being inquisitive. And our, our birth kids, they, they, wanna, they will foster, I think, or do something similar when they're older. They've learned a lot from it. It's been important for us all to, to, to be on the journey together. Yeah. And I've also heard, uh, you know, uh, foster carers say that your own children can act as a good icebreaker as well, because children Absolutely. relate to children initially. So that initial awkwardness can be made a lot easier. Definitely. Um, I mean, in, in our um, situation, um, we have a little boy and girl with us who are placed permanently. And um, she always looks up to her big sisters. And often she says, I get to... Not, not the exact words, but basically I get too emotionally involved in conversations. So she'll bypass me and she'll say to the girls, um, can we have a movie night or can we go for a drive in the car? And that often means that she wants to tell them something to tell me. So it's filtered. Yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah, the, the, the whole, it is a whole family thing. You can't get away from that. And, and another thing as well, it's not just your children, but your the animals in your home as well. Yeah. Or you know, yeah. pets. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, eh, eh, we, we've had so many experiences where we our, our dog passed away last year. Um, we, that dog literally, you know, fostered okay. at least two children for us yeah. because <laughs> they, they, they trusted this tiny dog yeah. more than they trusted us because humans had let them down so much in life and then you know the, the animals hadn't and so I think that's an, an important part of your extended family that is, is really important to foster children yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and that's often a question that we get asked is can you foster with pets you know there's a bit of a myth out there and it's almost like the opposite isn't it there's a there's a well, benefit think, too yeah, yeah. yeah. Massive the, only, the only thing I would say is you have there's a form for like um for a dog like to assess the safeguarding of a dog our dog was gorgeous 
but there isn't for the cat and our cat is horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> so I think <laughs> that's the only thing. Yeah. We're definitely not happy when we discovered that 17 years ago yeah, when we, we got her and she's still here. Yeah, we still but, <laughs> but I do think pets are like, you know, it is, it's a whole family experience. Yeah. Like a roller coaster. <laughs> and then I was going to ask you about, um, you know, obviously the reason you became foster carers and wanting to make a difference. Um, if there's any standout moments or when as a foster carer, do you start to realise that you are making a difference? And, and how do you notice the change over time? Um, and, and what does that look like? How how do you do you wake up one morning and go, yep, yeah, we've we've cracked it? Or is it is it small moments where you notice um, yeah. improvements? No, <laughs> I think I'm, sh I'm shaking my head as going, well, there's two, there's, there's the two. One, you don't notice it initially. You have to have moments of reflection. Yeah. And so occasionally we'll get folks. So and it happens with the kids as well. They they got they'll say to you sometimes. Oh, you know, you know, how did that look when I came here? And and, and they they completely forgotten because it's 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 a whole blur. Um, there's so much happens to move. And so occasionally we get the photo album as well, Google Photos actually, and then get the kids on it and then show them the pictures and they go, I didn't look like that. And you go, You did that's what you look like. No, I didn't. And then especially when the child's come and they've been underweight and 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 they've we they've had to put weight on and to, to look healthy and they, and they look back and, and also it helps us because we look back and go, do you remember that? Yeah, yeah do you remember that? Yeah. And then you suddenly realise how far they've come. But yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't really notice it because it's just like your own children, you, you don't. Mm -hmm. um, it's little things though. It's, it's, it sounds really silly, but for a couple of our children, when you go to pick them up from school, my kids have... I have forgotten them, I'll be honest, maybe once or twice, not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Just if people who know me well know that I'm a little bit forgetful. But um, in general, I would pick them up from school <laughs> every day, no question asked. And if I was late, they, they would come up with it's traffic, it's something. I would, a couple, well, actually, two children I can remember um, the fear if you were more than three seconds late from picking the children up, if you weren't first in the front of the line the fear that not only have I been let down by my family but now this person's not coming for me so for me it's little things like going to school and the what the first time I was late for one child um and they just sort of tutted and went I told you she'd come and that was massive because and I, I cry at everything I do I'm sorry everything it's, literally everything so <laughs> that was the that was a crying moment where you're walking out the playground, wiping, you know, wiping the tears without people recognising because it's such a big, for us, it was a big moment. For other people looking, it was nothing. But yeah. for us, it was massive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's that yeah, yeah. that trust, isn't it? That, that you know, trust develops. And I know, yeah. Phil, you've you've got a, a memory yeah. of that, you know. Yeah, the, the what would what, one of uh, one of our favourite ones is with this little boy. He's been with us nearly eight years now, and when uh, after a few years, um, every morning we would have to help him put his shoes on. He could physically, practically do it. There was only Velcro. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't that hard. Uh, but every morning he'd go, "Help me with my shoes. Help me with my shoes." And um, we realised that for him, this was part of a uh, the anxiety of leaving the house. A bit like what you were saying there, Jill. To him, even though he was going to a school where he knew his teachers, he knew his TA, he knew everybody there, he knew the other kids, he was leaving our house, which had become a safe place for him. And the putting the shoes on was his, like, be as close to me as you possibly can, have you as close as, as you can, I can get you. And then we noticed, both me and my wife went, have you noticed he puts his shoes on himself now and he just goes out the door? He doesn't need that little ritual of being safe. Most kids go through something like that. I mean, he was about 10 or 11, so he was older than most kids. We thought, you know what? he's feeling safer. He's feeling mm -hmm. that little bit more secure. But you, I think when you foster, you, you really look out for those sort of things. Those little, yeah. they're like yeah. milestones, but they're incredible mm -hmm. to you. They're, so other people go, what's the big deal? He puts Velcro right. shoes on. Wait, wait till he does laces. But you're like, no, nah, we'll, we'll worry about them <laughs> when he's a lot older. But it was, the, it, it was the fact that he was happy to leave the house and gain that little bit of independence, he was feeling more secure. And it's, it is, it's a beautiful moment. Yeah. I don't cry as much as Jill, but I do cry at things like that. <laughs> I'm not sure, Phil. <laughs> ah. 
superb. And I just wanted to touch on, um, if anybody watching, by the way, has got any questions at all, feel free to type them in the comments and I can see them and we'll, we'll answer them. Um, but I just wanted to touch on the different types of fostering, because uh, I know Jill and Les, you um, have had a big moment today because um, mm -hmm. you've moved to uh, what's called permanence, which means that the um, two siblings that are with you now are going to be with you, you know, long term. Um, yeah. But so have you always fostered siblings or uh, and did you, going into fostering, did you have an idea of an age, um, an a, age of children and whether it should be siblings or not? Or We did. I, I'm, I'm a nationary. So instantly I thought this is great. I can work from home. So it meant that I had more time for my children. I could get the washing and ironing and all that kind of basics done and out the way so we could enjoy our weekends. So we went for under three <laughs> and our first placement changed our minds. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> Within maybe two days, I re yeah, one, I think I'd realised we were older. Um, it, it was difficult. So we then upped it to like three to fives. Yeah. Um, and that sort of worked for us. And then I think it was a fear for me because I felt like a child over, this is going to sound awful, but I'm probably not going to say it properly, but a child under seven is a, is a child. They're little, they're moldable almost. They're compliable a lot of the time and because of their ages, not all the time, but a lot. Um, and I felt as the child got older, I was quite fearful of having older children. But actually, after doing it for just a couple of, probably about a year or two, mm. we realised that they're all children. Yeah. But even up to the age of 15, 16, they're children and yeah. they need somebody. And they, So for us, we were always short-term foster carers, which meant that you could have a child. Well, our, our least um, amount of time was a okay. day, okay. one day. <laughs> We've had a placement for one day, but then we've also had, um, the others were around about a year yeah. long. Um, but when the children we've got now came, um, it, it, I'll be honest, it took a, a while for us to decide to change because with um, when we were just doing short term, we could take time off in between placements. We could decorate the house, go on holiday, that kind of stuff. But actually when the children who've come now become an actual part of the family it, it, that didn't matter anymore and um yeah i think the, the big thing to remember is that as a foster carer it's totally different to adoption in in the respect that you the ultimate goal if things all go well is that the child will go back to their family because ultimately it's it's gone for want of a better phrase, it's gone wrong if they have to stay with a foster carer in permanence or with us. Ultimately, it would be lovely for grandparents or another member of the family to come forward and say, I'll take these children on. So the ultimate goal really is for a children always to go back to its family. And that's that's a victory. That's a massive victory. And it's happened on all of our places. Uh, all other than this one, yeah. This is the okay. only one where we haven't had a child go back to another member of family. So for those people who, who are listening who are thinking, oh, how long would... You know, the ultimate goal really is to try and get them back to their family. Um, if if you're in the situation that we've recently found ourselves in, where we, we we don't want these children to go, but they've got nowhere else to go, and they're now part of our family, then then they're not going to go. They're, they're staying with us, you know, and, and we'll fight tooth and nail for them. So you'll find yourself. It's, every child that comes into your care. Will be a different chapter uh, yeah. Yeah. A, different, a different a different chapter in your experience of fostering It'll, as jill just said it could be a day it could be for the rest of their life um yeah. that, that, and that it, it but you just don't know from one minute to the next it, it and it, and everyone is a massive learning experience everyone yeah. um yeah and I guess as time goes on, uh, as you you become more experienced, you, what you thought you wanted at the beginning, like you say, can change. And people people that start fostering and say, I couldn't do teenagers, I couldn't do siblings, often do end up going there because your confidence yeah. grows. And it, like you say, they're all they're all children, and that they all need the same support. You, you know, you do get choices. You you are considered. Well, yeah. we we always have been. We've got an amazing supervisor and social worker. And 
you know, whatever we've said that we think we can cope with and we think that we can deal with. And that that changes with experience and with um, training and time that um, we've always, yeah, we've always been very fortunate that we've we've not really been in over our heads, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and and, it, and if the times where we felt we needed help and support, it, it has been there. Um, yeah. That's good. And that's kind of part of what, what we call the matching process. And, you know, people often say, well, could I choose what age or, you know, would some, is someone just going to turn up like tomorrow? And it's that you are consulted, aren't you? I think everyone's, everyone when they're approved as a foster carer is approved for any age between 0 to 18, just to give that flexibility of how you might develop over time. But there definitely is that what, what's the preference and discussions about what you're comfortable with and what fits with your lifestyle. Yeah. And when you get the phone call, you're all, you can say no. So we've had a couple of phone calls and we've, we've literally gone, I'm so, so sorry. And we know we've got an empty placement here, but it, it, that just doesn't seem something we can, is viable for us. Um, and there's been a couple of occasions where we have literally had an hour's notice. But again, that was our choice to say, yeah, we can, we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's where, where it is. You know, often um, you, you are... Again, I think because of our supervisor, social work, worker, you are able to um, to have a choice and a voice in, yeah. in it all. Yeah. And like you were saying before, Les, there's the, a difference between fostering and adoption. One of those big differences is as a foster carer, you're part of a team, aren't you? You're part Absolutely. of a team trying Absolutely. to kind of do the best for that child. And um, have you your experience of working within the fostering team and and the support that you get from your supervisor and social worker and the children's social worker how does that work and how how has that helped you i guess on your journey well i, I think for us um we the children that we've got now has a lot of social workers from day one and that isn't great it isn't and um, i know liverpool you know say say themselves that it, it, you know it was just difficult and where with staffing and things, but they've now had their social worker for a long time, and I hope she stays because I think for the consistency with it, with these children is, is the, the biggest thing. Um, we've been very fortunate, and I'm, and it might sound we often get asked like like with today, why aren't we adopting the children? And the truth of the matter is, and I'm going to be completely honest, this is my job. If I adopt the children, I'd have to go and get another job. And the complexities and the needs that these children require are full time. It takes it takes up majority of my day and evenings and weekends and you know all of us. Mm. But I think we've been very fortunate as well that with a foster child, you are more able to get the support and help from professionals or from mm. well, other agencies yeah. who. Um, when the child needs the support, and because of the complexities of our children. I, I, we couldn't uh, ever chance that those that support would be taken away. Yeah. And, and, and that support, as you just said there, from the rest of the team. You know, yeah. you, 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 I wouldn't want to lose that support from the rest of the team, and and and, and that's important because I mean, that's for those people who are listening who, who maybe don't know how the how the social workers interact with us, as we have our own supervising social worker who's whose primary care as, as us yeah. as foster carers and then the children have another social worker that is is their um is their priority so they they both have each other's you know interests at heart they want to make sure that we're kept well and and commu everything's communicated to us so that we are engaged with the children at, at that level and then they also have their social worker to be able to make sure that those children are well looked after so um yeah, it's it's important that people understand that it's it's not just one social worker involved. There's actually, a, as you said, they've just said, there's a whole team involved. Yeah. So um, yeah, it is good. Fabulous. Um, and what about the training that um, you get offered as a foster carer as well? What would you say about the training that that has been on offer from Liverpool? Um. So you you have to do there's like core training that you have to do. So I think there's three or four core training things that you have to do. And um, they, they've been great. They, they were fine. Some of them were from outside agencies coming in and, and things. I think um, they really upped their um, training over the last maybe two years. Yeah. 
um, and there seems to be a lot more on offer that's applicable to everyday living with a child who suffered trauma and attachment especially and um, so I think as a foster care if you if you if you're wanting that training and um, there's been a couple of courses that I've been on and um, that have that there's only been a small number of people on um, and it seems such a shame sometimes because especially the course for attachments and trauma I, I, I wasn't aware of it didn't know it was a real thing never even heard the phrase you know trauma attachments went on a course and it just changed the whole way that I think about supporting and looking after the children that we live with and often um it's class as therapeutic parenting but the best phrase that I think I was told on it was that you can do it 40 percent wrong and it's still okay <laughs> and I go to that 40 percent way more than 40 percent but <laughs> yeah um I, I I think I think there's still space for more um individual training so you know looking at certain different families maybe who've got specific needs and requirements to you know I, I think that everyone should do the attachments and trauma course before they even become foster parents yeah if I'm that that's my yeah. view on it and um, because it also gives you a real understanding of what children are going to be coming into your home yeah yeah, yeah. And I guess a little bit of that is covered in the skills to foster as well that you do pre-approval. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds, all, you know, it's really sad because, yeah, I'm, there was quite a few couples at the skills to foster and, and I don't think many of the people come through because it is, it's frightening to think someone's going to be looking into your life. Um, but honestly, once that part's over and done with, yeah, um, yeah it, it's, I, I can't, it, it's not, there's no, the value that you get from this job, you can't even name it, can you mm -hmm. really? Because mm -hmm. it, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, there's days where on that roller coaster you are way down in that dark tunnel somewhere and you're not quite sure if the, yeah, you know, the ride's stopped and broken <laughs> for a bit. <laughs> but that feeling that you get when you're going up high and, you know, coming back, or when you get them feelings and then, you know, it's not an item that you fix and it's not so, uh, something you supply into somebody it's a life it's an actual real life mm. that you are making us even if it's only a small change you're making a small change to make their life better and I think that's in itself is probably why we do it yeah yeah I think, yeah I think that's that's one of the things that I, I was just making some notes before and I was just trying to get up there on, on, on my phone I was just kind of looking at the five points of well-being are but one of them is you know, doing something. I, I know a couple of them. I two of them I <laughs> but doing something that you feel is a, a challenge each day, doing something, doing something out of kindness for somebody else for no reason. I think I can't remember what the other ones are. Um, but you get to do all of those five points of well-being with a, with a foster child every day. Yeah. Every day you fill that. So your well-being in being a foster carer is massively increased because you. You, we, we often say, what would we do now if we weren't possible? And we were just thinking, you so boring. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the kids are doing, the daughter's just graduated from university. One of the daughters is, 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 uh, is, is an older high, he's a physiotherapist. And we're thinking, you would mean during the day. What would you do? There'd be nothing to do. And, well, I'd I'm, I'm, I'm be at work. And, yeah, you know. Yeah, but it, 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 your life, suddenly changes the dynamics of everything you do just just changes and it's for the better yeah. you know regardless of of, of what you the, the fear of going into it yeah life is better yeah that, that's wonderful and i feel you feel you you say that don't you about when you became foster carers that you were you were at risk of you know maybe becoming a little bit <laughs> mundane. I, I was a, i like to think i was at risk of becoming boring uh, we had this never, pebble, never. Pebble, never. pebble, good, good jobs, good careers, pebble dash on the walls. It was all normal. It was all normal. But there has never been a boring day when we fostered. I wish there were yeah. a few boring days <laughs> occasionally. Yeah, but boring, you, nice but I'm, I'm just sort of thinking about it because we've we've a little man. We've had him. Uh, he's been with us nearly eight years now. And I'm, I just remember when. So we did some respite where kids would just come 
for a few days when their when their regular carer was busy or away or something like that. But I remember we did emergency once where we got a phone call about one in the afternoon saying, could you take a boy? He's 10 and he's Russian and he's, uh, can you take him at four o'clock today? And we went, yeah. And the adrenaline rush was pretty intense of, oh my word, there's a 10 year old. He's coming and he's Russian. And um, I went on YouTube to work out how to say hello in Russian. This little kid, and just imagine it, if you're listening, imagine it, this 10, this 10 year old, he had no idea at that time that his mum had been taken ill and that he couldn't go home. They couldn't find any other family members. So he's at school. He's trying to leave school. He's coming out of the school gate with his bag and all that after, you know, numeracy and literacy and all these things. Teacher has to grab him and say, oh, you need to come and see the head teacher. He's going, what have I done wrong? Goes into the head teacher's office and this social worker, sort of strange lady that he's never met says, you can't go home to your mum because she's ill. You need to come with me and you need to come and live with these strangers. And he's going, I don't want to. <laughs> I'm not. And they had to convince him that, well, you have to because your mum is ill. And he's going, well, how ill? And they're going, well, we don't really know. Anyway, so the social worker has to get, get this lad, put him in the car, drive him to our house. What they talked about on that 20-minute drive, I do not know. Because, you know, what, what do you say to a kid who's like, what am I doing? Anyway, this kid, social worker comes in. Me and my wife had decided. Yeah, you talk, I said to her, you know, she was going to talk to the social worker. I was going to talk to the boy. We just divided it like that. We just thought, why not? <laughs> so this kid comes into our house and he's in the school uniform that he left in in the morning. You know what I mean? All he's got is a, is a knockoff Adidas bag. And we know it was knockoff because all the letters had fallen off. Right. Was just a dust. And I said to him and I was so proud. I went, Privyet! which, as everybody knows, is the Russian for hello. His first, and he did spit, yeah, did you not know that? Well, you know now, no. his, you've learned that. His, his first, like, sentence to me was, and he did speak in kind of scouse. He, like, he's like, he was like count, the count of Sesame Street. He goes, and he said, why you speak Russian? I'm not Russian. I'm not from Russia. And I'm like, you're not from Russia? And he goes, no, I'm from, and I won't say what it is. I'm from another country. So he wasn't even Russian. So he was 10. He was a boy, <laughs> but he wasn't from Russia. And all I'm going to say is the country he was actually from is a thousand miles away from Russia. Yeah. So it wasn't like he would, you know, imagine if you call a scouse or a mank, he kicks off. <laughs> this this wasn't even the same <laughs> neck of the woods. He came in and I went, um, and then we ended up chatting about which is your favourite hula hoop, Chris? Because it was, it's a neutral question. Isn't it? What's your favourite hula hoop? And it turns out it was blue. And then we ended up playing FIFA because again, we got kids, we got an Xbox. We ended up playing FIFA. And um, my wife sort of, you know, have you got, you know, what, what's your favourite team? You like Liverpool. And so we went and got him pyjamas, pants, socks, vests. He didn't have anything with him. And I, I say we did not make his first day in care good, but we made it a less crap than it could have been. Yeah, yeah. And that's sometimes all you can do. And yeah. he, he lived with us for a while. His mum, the good news is his mum got better and he was able to go back and live with her. You know, and you're thinking, well, while he was with us, he was safe. Yeah. And, he, he, and he did have a few laughs as well, eventually, once he'd recovered from, why am I here? Who are you? And, you know, that, uh, like, uh, like many people, we've got big families. If something happened to me and my wife, you know, touch wood, our kids would go to nans, aunties, uncles. He just didn't have anyone who he could go to. So he ended up washing up in our house. Yeah. If you think you could look after a kid in those circumstances, let's face it, most of us would say, yes, we would, if, yeah. if that happened get in touch, try and find out a little bit more about it, see if it's for you. Um, mm -hmm. He was a cracking, he was a hilarious kid, that one. <laughs> um, thank you. And I guess I just wanted to finish on a couple of things. Was um, Oh, Lynn Mostergill says hello, by the way, young feed. So hi, hi, Lynn. Lynn. Helen, um, just wanted to finish on a couple of things. If anyone is watching and, and you know feels inspired by listening to you, but is wondering whether they can do it, uh, what what does it take to become a foster carer? What skills or what type of qualities do you need? Obviously, the 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 basic requirements are over twenty one and a spare room, and then everything else is you know to to be discussed really. So, yeah, what would you say is um, are the the best qualities that you need to consider? Well, I've got a list. And my oh. list of only three things. So the first and most important is you've got to like children. <laughs> because I have Always actually a met a few people who foster don't to like children. <laughs> so I'm just putting it out there yeah. that it, it involves it's children. It's <laughs> yeah. um, the second one was to have, if you can, 
to have a good support network. It doesn't matter if it's people you've met. I, I've met a couple of people to, through fostering, um, but I was actually buddied up at the beginning with a, a gorgeous lady um, who really supported and helped our family over many situations. Um, so, um, yeah, to have a support network, it doesn't have to be big at all, just somebody who you can talk to and just sort of, you know, can maybe help with, with the just day-to-day -day things, occasionally with the child. But the third one is a sense of humour. Yeah. If you haven't got that, don't do this job. Yeah. <laughs> you will be insulted in a very nice way often. Um, we had one boy who, yeah, and I know people say about it, he did steal our hearts. But you know what? We're adults. We've got, we've got over it. it. It just hurt for a little while. And that's the worst thing that's going to happen is that your heart hurts for a little while. But we had him and one day, he was sitting on my knee and he was telling me how beautiful I was. And I was obviously, you know, mil you know, I was made up. And he was going, I love your hair and I love your blue eyes and I love your chins. <laughs> so I, I obviously looked at him in this. <laughs> and he went, don't worry, I love both of them. <laughs> Equally. <laughs> So for me, for me, yeah, you've got to have it. And you know what? A sense of humour gets you through everything in this job. You laugh about things that no other, about no other person, no other profession will laugh at. I'll I, be honest. So. I've had the ball pass rubbed in someone's scrubby skull head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, they pick any Just, floor, any floor that's yeah, out there. Floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now look at yourself in the mirror, see what it is, because yeah. it's going to come out at some point. <laughs> But that's a very good point, though. Like Lynn, who's watching us now, told told us a story about you know taking the little boy to the park. He was wearing a, a yellow t shirt, uh, no, a football t shirt, and he yeah. uh, kicked the football into uh, lots of daffodils and got lost. And it was it was fun in the park, and he thought it was hilarious that they couldn't find him. But that's you know <laughs> children at the end of the day, and that's you've got to be prepared to have fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wonderful well i think that's it i think we haven't got any que oh no we have got a question i know we've just got a comment for us thank you Jeanette, for your comment that's really nice um yeah i think i was going to just look at what some typical questions that we um usually get um we've covered the support network um we've covered the age range um when the foster placement ends, are you able to keep in touch with the children? So um, we, that's a difficult question. So more than often on short term, for, for us, it's not happened. We did get the chance with one boy, or we found that it meant that he, we, he, he wasn't moving on in his placement because um, his attachment to us was so great. So we, we had to, we had to take the to end that, that sort of contact, which we were devastated with, but it was the right thing for him to move into his new family. But we do have one boy um, who, uh, a Polish boy, who um, who does regularly email and message. And um, yeah, occasionally the inbox comes in and he honestly just, when we get any message from him at all, because he came to us, he was probably the oldest child we'd had and um, come from a whole different culture. Like Phil said, we thought, what are we gonna do? He's not gonna speak English. We've got a friend who's Polish, she can help us. He was as scout as we were. <laughs> we didn't yeah. have to worry. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I think for, for us, I think because he was that little bit older, um, he, he does get in contact with us. But I actually do believe that there are certain children that we are waiting for them just to knock on the door. Because I do believe yeah. that you, you impact, you know the children you've impacted. We've had one placement and the boy had a box in the house, plastic box. Anything we gave him, anything, toys, get birthday gifts, anything, went in this box till he went back to his dad. And he did go back to his dad and he didn't wave and he didn't, he didn't thank, nothing. It was literally, we were there just to get him to this place. So it's actually, um, yeah, it varies. It mm -hmm. does vary, I think. 
Um, I think a lot of our friends who who fostered younger children, so babies, ten to four under threes, do sometimes have better contact uh, because I think the families are very grateful for the input at the beginning, um, you know, on routines and things like that. So yeah, so it depends. It, it depends, isn't it? It's in it's in the interests of the kid, really. Absolutely. And if that, so we 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 had a little boy who was three and a half when he arrived. By the time he was just over four and a half, he was being, he got adopted. So he went to live with a, a different family, you know, forever family. And we had some contact with him, but it was probably better for him to reestablish himself with his, yeah. with his new family than stay in, in contact with us. And it is an emotional time. Yeah. You know, like Les Absolutely. and Jill said, you laugh a lot, but you, you do cry. And occasionally people say, oh, what if you get too attached? And I go, yeah, you do. And it's you. I'm a big. I'm not as. Am I as old as you, Les? I don't know. But I, 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 don't know. But I just use all, I, all of you. Right? I, I, I don't mind if I have to. If it makes me cry that a kid gets to live safely, Absolutely. and if a, if it breaks my heart a little bit that a kid gets a forever home, that is a price that we pay. Absolutely, and I think I'm going to cry now. I'm just crying yeah, thinking about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't get your heart broken, you've not done your job properly, as far as yeah, I'm yeah, concerned. yeah. So. Boston's like a good film. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 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 lots of ups and downs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's obviously there's lots that we haven't covered today about the pro, you know, the process to become a foster carer and all the the all the community side that we do. I know Jill and Les, I've seen you at our Christmas party because we have one every year, mm -hmm. and hopefully yeah. we'll have have another one this year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But if anyone does want to find out any more about fostering. Um, you can contact us with the details on the screen and then Phil, they can come and chat to you, can't they? You yeah, yeah. Zooms. Got to do Zooms and, and I'll, I go, when I'm allowed, I'll go out and visit people, but I'm not on commission. Do you know what I mean? I don't get paid <laughs> if you sign up. And it, if you, if you, seriously, if you show interest, like when we did, we rung up to say, you know, we want to find out more. Um, it takes a few months, maybe four, five, six months, something like that to go through the process. So you've actually, you've got time to think, find out more about it do I really want to do it but I mean I'm glad we applied because you've got nothing to lose if you apply and you're not the social workers are not going to drop a kid off around your house you know the next day you you do have to be approved and assessed there's lots of checks there's training so but find out you've got nothing to lose by finding out by getting in touch love to talk yeah. to you more we would we'd love to hear from you thank you very much for watching everyone and uh, we'll be back soon thank you thank you how do these end? Just wave. Just like, bye. <laughs> <Is that it? laughs>